Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in today for more of our leadership content. It is our hope to develop leaders, whether that be in the church, in the home, or in our city, in our community. And so we're glad that you're here. Uh, Please feel free to join with us as we meet every first Friday of every month uh, for our leadership lunches. Uh, But you can find more information on our website at www.declarationchurch.net. All right, guys. Hey, we're going to get started. Um, Thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, You know, we just started these leadership lunches this semester, and uh, our hope is just to continue to develop leaders, not just in our church, but in our community, uh, and give you guys leadership tools to put in your leadership tool belt, uh, just as you lead in, in different places, spaces, whether that be the church, whether that be in your home, whether that be in your friendship circles, people that you uh, are currently developing, uh, wherever that might be. Also, today you might notice, but we are recording this uh, for the first time, and we're going to put this up on our YouTube channel just to create a little bit more content. Uh, And so make sure you go on there and like and subscribe and share and do all the things that you're supposed to do. All right. Uh, So today... Uh, I want to talk to you guys about the idea of relational intelligence, relational intelligence. Uh, I have done a little bit of uh, listening and reading and kind of tuning into this idea of relational intelligence. There is a pastor named Dr. Darius Daniels uh, here. I actually don't even know where he's at, but he has written a book and done several podcasts about this idea of relational intelligence. And his book is titled uh, Relational Intelligence. And so some of what I'm going to give to you today uh, comes from his material and some of it we've kind of crafted and made it our own. But I want to define what relational intelligence is first and foremost. It's this, it's sharpening our relational skills in order to define and align our relational circles in order to invest wisely, not wastefully. All right. Sharpening our relational skills in order to define and align our relational circles in order to invest wisely and not wastefully. So why is relational intelligence important? Uh, We hear a lot of uh, things about emotional intelligence. Uh, I know for many in our church and our leadership, we've gone through emotionally healthy leadership. So we know about that. We know about different forms. But why is relational intelligence so uh, important? Well, one is that relationships are meaningful. Right. Relationships are a key part of our lives. Uh, It's where many of us uh, receive a lot of blessings, a lot of joy, a lot of life, a lot of encouragement. Uh, But it can also be a source of a lot of pain, a lot of suffering if relationships aren't done well, uh, if we're not in healthy relationships. Uh, The second thing is this, is that relationships matter. Who you hang out with uh, will determine who you become. Uh, Who you hang out with will also determine where you're going in life. Uh, I've heard it said before that it's not so much who you know, or it's not so much how much you know as who you know. And if you've lived life long enough, you you can look back on jobs, maybe grad programs uh, that you're like, man, there is no way that I should have gotten into that job, that program, that that team, whatever, if it wasn't for this relationship with this person. And so relationships are incredibly, uh, they matter a lot. Uh, People will make us or break us. People can either pull us up or people can drag us down. It's why King Solomon would say, walk with the wise and you will become wise. But a companion of fools suffers harm. Uh, That's in Proverbs 13, 20. Uh, Another one from the Bible is Apostle Paul, where he said, bad company corrupts good morals in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Uh, I I love this quote from Dr. Daniels. He says this, that you as a Christian, you can't get Christianity right and relationships wrong. You can't get Christianity right and relationships wrong. We see that really clearly in first John. uh, But you can just think about the greatest commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, We can't get Christianity right and relationships wrong. And the third thing I want to just throw out there, why this matters and why it's so important, is that relationships take time. They take investment. Uh, We only have so much time in our lives, right? Uh, Everybody, it doesn't matter uh, where you're at, how old you are, uh, how rich you are, it doesn't matter. You have 24 hours every day. And we'll spend about a third of that sleeping. 
right? Liz, maybe more, all right? Maybe half if you're Liz. Uh, but, but you'll spend about a third of that sleeping, about a third of that at work, all right? So you're involved with coworkers and boss and peers and, and people under you or whatever that looks like. And then you'll spend another third with friends, with family, uh, with people at church or people in this group or that group. And so uh, who are you spending time with? You, you hear that phrase a lot. And, and the question that I would throw out to you is how are you spending that time in relationships? Are you spending it wisely or are you spending it wastefully? This is why we must approach relationships wisely, not wastefully. This is why we need to have relational intelligence. All right, so where do we begin? I, wanna, I want you to think of three concentric circles. Yeah, I want you to think of three concentric circles, okay? So think of those things as not only your impact, but your influence. Uh, when I was little, I loved, uh, my grandmother had this pond, and we would go out there and throw rocks in it. Right. And you would throw rocks in it and you would just see the ripple effects. Right. And of course, as a as a little boy, we're like, let's find the biggest rock we can. And we would get another rock. We'd throw it in there and just to see the ripples because it would cause a bigger ripple effect. And if we could get like a boulder sized rock, we would throw that as far as we can. And it would create even more. And the same is true in our relationships. All right. From from the center, those closest to us, we're going to have the most impact or the most influence on those people. And so the center and I'm going to go real, real Christian for you today. The center has got to be your spiritual life. All right. We understand these, this idea that if you're not feeling well physically, if you're not doing well emotionally, then you're not going to be able to perform or relate as well uh, in, in relationships or at work. Well, the same is true spiritually. When, when Christ is not center of your life and that relationship's not going well, other relationships will be negatively affected. We talk about this all the time with our ministry team that when we've got to get poured into from Jesus so that we can then pour out. If there's nothing in that cup, I can't share that with Mackenzie, right? If there's nothing in my cup and she's thirsty and she needs a drink, I can't share anything if I don't have anything in my cup. I have to go to the source and I have to get filled up before I can fill into others. We see this over and over. 1 John 4, 8 says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And so when we know God and we know love, therefore we'll be able to love others. We also see this beautiful picture of marriage in Ephesians 5, where it says husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church. But before he tells them that, he, he also says, hey, you need to, uh, you're called to love them, love your spouse as you love yourself. We have to be able to love ourselves before we can actually love others. All right. We see this over and over. The point is this, our ability to relate well with other people flows out of a healthy relationship with our creator. As Christians, we understand that, all right? So we're gonna move on. So the second circle is this, and we call this the three Fs. It is the faith family, it is the family, so your mom, your dad, your siblings, cousins, whatever, grandmother, uh, and then your friends, all right? The three Fs is kind of that, that next circle. Uh, we see that in the, in the scriptures, uh, in Acts 2, that the faith family was devoted to the fellowship. They were devoted to one another, right? If Christ were to give his life for the church, then we should probably have that as a high value and relationship in and of ourselves. There's a really fascinating text that a lot of uh, Christians, we don't like, a lot of people, this offends them, where uh, the, the disciples came to Jesus and, he sa and they said, hey, Jesus, your mom and your brothers are outside waiting for you. And Jesus said, and it seemed really cold, but in Matthew 12, 49, he says, he says, who are my mothers and brothers? Whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And what he's doing there is he's, he's actually not equating our faith family relationships with our familial relationships. He's actually saying, hey, I think they're actually higher. Those who follow Christ and believe in Christ and, and walk with those relationships should even have precedence over our family relationships. But obviously we know family relationships are really key too, right? And uh, we're coming up on Thanksgiving in a couple weeks. Some people are excited about that. Some people are dreading that. Some people are like, ah, oh, we got to go deal with this cousin or we got to go deal with this aunt or with this uncle. And those are hard relationships. And so we have to have relational intelligence to know 
how to invest in those people, how to navigate those relationships. We see this in, in marriage. We see this is with kids. Those of you who have kids or want kids one day, you only have a certain time with them. Uh, I wake up every day, my kids are in junior high and high school, and I wake up every day going, oh my gosh, I only have three more years until they fly the coop, until they go out on their own. I only have four more years. But it seems like just yesterday that they were in the, you know, the baby Bajorn, you know? Uh, I'm like, man, how did this happen? Uh, how are we buying Corbin a car, right? Um, anyways, you, but these are important relationships that we need to invest in and be a part of. And so we need relational intelligence to know how to navigate those things. All right, and the, and the other F in that circle is this idea of friends, the idea of friends. And, and I put that in there because if you think about it, uh, I don't know if you've noticed this, but have you seen the term friendsgiving lately? Where people are like, hey, I'm going to do Thanksgiving with my, my family, but really I just want to be with my friends. And people have come up with this brilliant idea. They're like, I would rather do this, this event, this holiday with my friends and really with my family. And so they go, we're going to go give our family some time and attention, but man, we're going to get together with our best friends and have this, uh, have this awesome time with them. And so uh, Proverbs 18, 24 says this, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And those of you who have siblings, you probably know those people. You're like, yeah, I can't stand my brother, but I love this friend, right? This guy's more of a brother to me than, than even my brother is. Jesus even said this in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Uh, Dr. Darius Daniels said this, and I loved it. He said, sometimes the only difference between a friend and someone who is family is that the friend just doesn't have the same last name. I love that. Just a great point. Now, he, here's why I needed to set all that up, because this is where we start getting into some blurry, uh, confusing uh, waters that we're like, I don't know how to navigate this. Because for our culture, we've really uh, blown up this idea of friends, right? Many of you have uh, 7,000 friends on Facebook. Do we know them all? I don't know. But this is where we need to define and align so that we can invest wisely, all right? So this third circle, and we're going to get into this, this third circle are the three A's. And the first one is this, the associates. They're associates. They're not friends. They're associates. And what, what these people are, you have intersected their lives and formed a relationship because of schedules, common interest, where you work, where you play, where you hang out where you go to dinner. Um, th this could be, for, for me, I have a lot of associates because my kids play the same sports with these people. Or I'll see them. Th there's a guy this past week that I, I showed up at my son's soccer practice a little bit early. Uh, I don't even know his name. I just know his son's name because we cheer his son on all the time. Uh, and, 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 but I see him every week. I see him three or four times a week. We're associates, right? If it wasn't for our kids playing on the same soccer t team, I'd probably never see him. I've never seen him out in town. I've never seen him, uh, you know, at church. I've never, we don't run in the same circles, but we are associates, all right? This is usually someone that you're building something with, all right? These people don't have the fruit or the possibility of time invested just yet to go emotionally deep with them. Uh, matter of fact, that, that guy that I was just telling you about that his son plays soccer with my son, a couple weeks ago, he just started sharing his story with me. And, uh, and, he, and I was like, man, does this guy do this often? Because he was sharing some really deep and vulnerable places, uh, a part of his life. And if I, wasn't an, if I wasn't a pastor and hear this kind of stuff all the time, honestly, I'd be like, man, this is kind of awkward that this guy doesn't know me. Like, I really wonder, do you know my name? Like, could, could you tell me my first and last name? I don't know that he could, but he's telling me about some of the greatest losses in his life. When it was interesting, but we've had a little bit of time together. And that's what happens with some associates. Some people that you're coworkers with, you end up being friends. You end up moving them into that friend zone, right? They end up becoming some of your best friends. Uh, but these people, when you think about associates, think about intersection. Intersection. This is why we need help defining this. Because for most of us, the term friends is really broad. Right? It's really broad. Uh, we see this from Facebook friends. I don't know how many times I've been scrolling through my Facebook feed and I'll find a picture of somebody that's posted in my feed as one of my friends and I'll click on it and be like, who is that? 
And I'll like have to go on some kind of deep dive to find out who is this and how do I, like I'm having to go, who are our mutual friends? Do I know them from these people or these people? Like we're friends on Facebook. We're really not friends in life. And so this is where we need to clearly define this level because sometimes it can bleed into the next circle. Here's where this gets us in trouble is that when, when one person assumes, hey, you're an associate of mine, but the other person assumes you're a friend, what leads to is unmet expectations lead to some frustration. Have you ever been in a relationship with somebody and they thought you were best friends and you were just like, no, no really, if I could term you, you're an associate to me. And all of a sudden they're mad at you because you haven't been a friend to them up to their expectations. This is why we begin to navigate these things with relational intelligence that, that kills some of that frustration and kills some of those expectations. To be honest, we don't have the space or the time to truly be friends with everybody. And if we try to do that, we're actually stealing space and time from those people who are our friends, who are our family, who we do want to invest in. And so that's why, why we've got to have uh, good relational intelligence to draw those lines, create boundaries. It's important that we rightly align these relationships. All right. The second is this advisors, advisors, uh, think in this investment. These are coaches, counselors, teachers. These are people who come into your life for a season and for a reason. Now, I can look back on my life and be like, man, Steve Harden was that for me my freshman year of college. Chris Kennedy was that my sophomore year of college. This person, Warren Samuels, has been that. Over and over, I can think about these people that have come into my life and God has ordained them to come into my life for a season and for a very specific reason. And I'm incredibly grateful for those people. All right. These these people have been have brought into your life so that they might invest in you so that they might develop you, so that they might grow you. We've got to have those people. We've got to have those people that will coach us, encourage us, champion us, all of those things, right? We've got to have those people that can have an outside view and looking in at our lives and go, hey, I want to speak into that. Most of these people are a little bit ahead ahead of us in life. They've already been around the block a few times. They've got a little bit more wisdom. They've seen what we're seeing. They've done what we're doing. You can think about these people as, as uh, parenting coaches, life coaches, heart coaches, just like we would have athletic coaches, coaches that coach you in football or baseball or soccer or whatever, that you have life coaches that do this. Now, same thing that I said, these people can move into different uh, realms. There's a guy named Johnny Myers uh, who works with the Kaleo Group, who, who was an associate of mine through the One Hope Movement. That's how I found him. We were brought into a room uh, for a season for a very specific reason. We were trying to build something together, and we became a little bit closer. And I've asked him this last year, hey, I'd like for you to coach me in leadership. And so he's moved into that realm. All right. Uh, And and who knows? Uh, He might be that kind of guy that moves into a friend relationship. Uh, I remember a couple years ago, uh, I was uh, going to see a counselor here in town and we just became good friends. And he was like, hey, I can't wait till we're done meeting so that we can start the clock. Because from two years from our last counseling appointment, we can go grab a beer together and hang out and be friends. And I'm like, that's awesome. And so I literally have that on my calendar. This next May will be the first time that I can call him up and go, let's go hang out. Let's go grab dinner. Because uh, n- no longer will he be a, uh, an advisor to me. Now he's moved into the friend zone for me. All right. Um, this last one is this idea of assignments, assignments. And when you think about assignments, think about intention. These people are, pl- are you are placed in their life for you to intentionally invest in them for a season and for a specific reason. We're kind of flipping the script here, all right? We don't know how long this could be. Uh, You think about Acts chapter eight, uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. I mean, literally they run into each other on the side of the road. Uh, Philip preaches the gospel for him, explains Isaiah 53, and literally he is whisked away by the spirit and that's it. We don't see any, we don't see them getting together at at the holidays. We don't see them writing Christmas cards. That was it. And that was the season. We also see with Paul in his missionary journeys in Acts 19 that he's with the Ephesian church at one point for three months and then with another group for two years. 
And you look at it and he's like, okay, he's teaching these people. He's preaching to these people for a season and for a specific reason. Some for three months, like a semester, some for two years. But thinking through what these look like, all right? Now, how do we align these? Because if, if, if we're called to invest, intentionally invest in people, there's got to be some alignment. There's got to be, be some discernment because we can't do everybody, right? We can't invest in everybody. We don't have the time. And so how do we get specific and go, this is the kind of person that I need to pour into? Three questions. One, you ask yourself about their commitment level. Are they committed? Are they faithful? Like if I'm going to invest in them, are they faithful to do it? I don't know if you've ever lent anybody money before, right? And that can be kind of a scary thing. But if you're lending somebody money, the question in the back of your mind is, are you faithful to pay this back? Well, in, with investment or discipleship or development or whatever that looks like, you need to ask that question. If I'm going to invest my time, my resources, my wisdom, all of these things with you, are you going to be, in, are you going to be faithful not to pay it back to me, but to pass it on to someone else? This is discipleship. This is why Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, what you've heard from me, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Are they committed? Are they committed? Second thing you need to ask is this about capacity. Do you, do I have the capacity to invest in them right now? We're in certain seasons where we don't maybe not have the time, right? Uh, there's, some, there's some mamas in here that have little babies. What happens with little babies is they take up a lot of your time. And so a lot of your time has been with them. And so you may not have a, as much time to invest in in a, in a mentoring relationship, right? Um, do you have the capacity? Do you have the time? Do you have the resources? Are you emotionally healthy to actually pour out? Or do you feel like you're in a dry season? And sometimes God takes us through dry seasons, right? Sometimes that's just life. Uh, we're going through a lot. We're dealing with a lot. And you just go, I don't have the capacity to invest in this person right now. It doesn't, that doesn't mean you're, you're mean or you're bad. That's wisdom. All right, the third thing is this, is calling. The first was committed. The second is capacity. The third is calling. Are you called to invest in them at this moment, at this point in time? Do you feel called to them? Well, I come into contact with a lot of people uh, in my job as pastor that I'm like, sometimes I'll have coffee with a guy and we'll connect. And I'm like, man, I love this guy. We have a very similar story. We connect. We have a lot of the same affinities. Uh, we have a lot of the same struggles. I feel like I am called to invest in this guy at this time. And there are others that come that I'm just like, I don't have that connection with you. Does that mean I'm not called to them? Maybe. M maybe someone else could pour into them better because they understand their life. They understand their struggles. And so just being real about that, do I feel called to invest in them? He here's my point in this. Jesus chose his disciples, right? He didn't sit back and wait for people to ask him. He went to the Sea of Galilee and said, James and John, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Je if Jesus chose his disciples and we're trying to be like Jesus, then we need to choose our disciples as well. We need to be intentional about that investment and go, I've been praying for you. I see you. I want to invest in you, all right? And, and, and to be okay with saying no to other people, as long as you're saying yes to someone. Because here's the point, we're commanded to invest in people. We're commanded, we're called by God to make disciples. The point is, not everyone is our responsibility. Not everyone's our assignment, and that's okay. I think that's, that's humility that we're going, hey, I'm not called to disciple you. I'm not called to disciple everybody, but we are called to disciple somebody. So finding that person, all right? Uh, God has called everyone equal in dignity and value, but he has not called you to equally disciple everyone. It, it, it has nothing to do with their value or their dignity or whatever. Uh, it actually has to do with you uh, being called to equally disciple this person. Uh, a couple of years ago when I was uh, a young pastor, young youth pastor, young father. Uh, there was a guy that was on this preaching circuit called, named Steve Farrar. 
Some of y'all might know that name. Uh, Phenomenal speaker, phenomenal writer. He's written a ton of books, really geared towards men. Well, there was a young lady that was a volunteer in our student ministry. Her name was Kat, and she was actually family friends with the Ferrars. And so she had just moved to the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, and they had said, hey, why don't you come live with us for a season, kind of find your people, and then you can go get an apartment with some girls or whatever. And so she lived with him. Well, I, when I find out that Kat knows Steve Farrar and lives at Steve Farrar's house, I was like, you have to set me up. You have to get me a lunch or whatever. So she does. I took him somewhere real fancy. I think it was Cotton Patch Cafe. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I was so excited to meet with him. I had a list of questions that I was going to ask him. And so I go into this meeting with all these questions that I'm going to ask Steve Farrar. All right? I mean, I had heard this guy speak uh, at the wall, uh, the, the mall in Washington uh, at, at the Promise Keepers event way back when. I mean, thousands, tens of thousands of people. And so I'm like, man, I'm blown away. Like I get to have lunch with this guy, whatever. Well, I'm asking him all these questions about ministry and being a dad and being a godly man, all these questions. He's just kind of like, you know, eating his food and spitting out answers just off the cuff. And it was amazing. And my last question that I had written down was this, will you personally disciple me? And I don't know if it's because I took him to Cotton Patch and not Chili's or somewhere nicer, but he said, no, no, I'm not going to disciple you. And I was kind of shocked that he was so quick to spit out that answer. You know, I was like, well, maybe you should be like, well, I'll pray about it. I'll get back to you. I'll email you. My my people will talk to your people, which I didn't have people, but he probably did. Uh, And so I'm I'm like, man, how did he answer that? So I was like, okay, well, why not? He goes, I don't have the time. I don't have the space. I've got my people that I'm investing in. I know what I'm called to do. I know what my capacity is. Like, I, I don't have time to meet with you. Okay, well, thanks so much for being straight. And I remember moving on, but that was a great lesson for me, for him to say no to me, for me to actually say no to other people. And it's not a shot on their dignity or their value or whatever. It's really just wisdom for me to go, I only have so much time. I only have so much capacity. I only have so much that I can actually pour out. And so this, this is why we need to be strategic in our investments with people. If we're going to spend our time with people, and we are in relationships, we've got to ask ourselves, are we spending it wisely or is this wastefully? Meaning, could I spend this time, could I spend this this effort, this energy, this discipleship in a better place? All right? This is what it looks like to be relationally intelligent. Mm -hmm.